So NFT is an acronym. It stands for non-fungible token. Fungible in the sense means transferable. So a US dollar is transferable. You change one US dollar for one US dollar, you're exchanging the same thing. Same with one Bitcoin for one Bitcoin. An NFT is non-fungible because if you exchange one NFT for another NFT, you're not exchanging one for one. An NFT is a one for one object. It's a unique object. Is this a, an yeah, appropriate definition? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> and an NFT doesn't have to be a piece of art. It could be pretty much anything you can imagine. There's NFT contracts and there's NFT songs. Uh, but we're here to talk about NFTs in the art space because the art world has really embraced them. And so I want to open up this conversation by asking all of you, uh, you know, what distinguishes NFT art from other types of art? Maybe well, the artist can <laughs> <to> answer this. <laughs> NFT is a, is a technology. Um, it is a permanent ledger of authenticity, of, of provenance of an artwork. So uh, essentially, as a digital artist, I've been practicing since 2012, creating digital art. Uh, before I discovered uh, NFTs in December of 2020, I really had a problem uh, presenting uh, a value proposition for a digital file to collectors because they're easily copied. And you can't establish the provenance. Anyone can claim that they own this digital file as, as the original. But now with NFTs, the original is clearly delineated in the blockchain, and therefore you have authenticity and rare, rarity attached to the artwork. So this is a game changer for many digital artists in particular. And for collectors, mm -hmm. you know, because there it, it increases the value of the image. Yes. Absolutely. Speaking to the technology and the use of the ledger, you're able to see how many people have transacted with the NFT, how, how much it's sold for, um, where it's gone. I mean, wallets are anonymous. It's just a series of uh, letters and numbers. but you can see exactly where it's been exchanged to. It's a clear provenance that cannot be in any way um, uh, faked or duplicated. Um, yeah, it's, it's fantastic for collectors. Yeah. And, and you mentioned uh, anonymity. I mean, that's so important. Privacy, not necessarily anonymity, but privacy is so important in the trade and to collectors. Um, so you can see that the uh, piece of artwork originated with the artist then went to maybe a gallery, then was sold, all that whole history, but you don't know who it is because the, uh, the entity is anonymized by a series of uh, numbers and code, which I can't produce. Maybe someone <laughs> down here can. <laughs> and uh, Krista, as the uh, NFT artist on stage, I would love to hear you speak more about what drew you to NFTs as, as a technology that can create art? Um, so I, I began this journey, um, I'm really into data privacy and data <coughs> sovereignty. Um, I disagree with surveillance capitalism practices of, of Web2. Um, I think it's an infringement upon human rights. And I always found that there's a problem there because you know, I have children and I want future generations to be able to control their own data to have self-custody of data because that, in essence, is the digital expression of democracy and free will. And so um, December 2020 <coughs> came around and you know COVID, all of this, and I was researching Bitcoin and Ethereum for my own investment portfolio. And then I discovered blockchain and, and the, you know, the, the mechanism, what, what can it do? And I thought, wow, I mean, if we can actually do this for art as artists, I think that it's um, an incredible, um, you know, uh, emancipation of, of many artists because what it creates is the ability for artists to own your IP and control your IP and, and disintermediate, uh, you know, the access to markets and to buyers through online markets <coughs> like Super Rare, for example. So I was very excited to mint my first piece in February of 2021 when I was whitelisted on the super rare platform. I was rejected from a few, actually, it's quite funny. <laughs> and, um, and I had the Mars house already you know, pre-made uh, a year uh, prior to that. During the COVID crisis, I created the Mars house as my dream home where I can escape in VR. 
And so um, I minted that home in March of 2021, and, and it truly changed my life. I mean, I've been creating digital art since 2012, but really the craze and the, the mania behind the new technology and the possibilities of creating art and I mean, the Beeple sale truly was a huge, momentous, you know, art world occasion and art canon, actually, because here is a new technology and everyone was just thrown into it. So being part of this movement, being a fine artist, entering the NFT space as an NFT artist was really an incredible experience. And for those of you who don't know, Beeple is another NFT artist, and last year he broke I, I'm assuming many records. He, he sold Six, some. 63.7 million, I believe. 63.7 million dollars for his NFT artwork. So, it's, it's and it was controversial. I mean, so Sotheby's auctioned it off. It's an image of 5,000 objects, many of which are incredibly misogynistic <laughs> and violent. And uh, you know, there's some debate as to whether. I, I, I'm assuming the experts looked at it, the specialists in detail. <laughs> well, yeah, all art is subjective, know. but his art is probably not for everyone. It's not for me personally, but you know, it was <laughs> for somebody. But, but it just sort of, it was a moment where people really realized that there was, this was a watershed. There, there's a lot of money to be made for NFT artists. Um, so you were talking about Super Rare, which is a platform where people can buy and sell NFTs. And so I wanted uh, to talk to Christiana because you founded uh, Pace Verso, which is Pace's dedicated NFT platform, correct? Exactly. Can it's you tell Can platform. you tell us a bit more about why why that is a thing and what, what it's been like to uh, yeah, operate absolutely. It? So um, you know, thinking about Pace's trajectory and history, we've always been a gallery and an institution that has embraced technology and wanted to really bridge the gap specifically between tech and art. We have a lot of advanced studio practice artists within our roster. Uh, studio Drift, uh, Lucas Mars, whose practice now has mostly just gone into the digital scape. Mm -hmm. um, Glenn Kaino as well. So our artists were actually coming to us in the midst of the craze around NFTs and interest in NFTs. This was, I believe, around March 2021, which is also around the time that I was actually hired uh, mm -hmm. to come onto the gallery as the online director. Um, and we kind of had to, to respond uh, to our artists' interests and their needs. Um, and there was so much noise, there still is a lot of noise within the space. Um, and naturally, as a gallery, you want to. Your responsibility is to shepherd your artists and to take care of them. Mm -hmm. um, so, after a lot of research in terms of thinking about partners we could potentially collaborate, we felt the best way that we could go about uh, entering the space and helping our artists enter the space was actually creating a platform. Um, so, in November of 2021, we launched Pace Verso. Uh, the first project that we launched was Lucas Samaras, his XYZ series, which was a series of work that we had launched prior in 2012 at the gallery in an exhibition. Um, he'd repurposed the works spe specifically into NFTs and then entered the works onto the blockchain. Um, followed by that, we had a project with Studio Drift and Don Diablo, who yes. Chris is very familiar friend, with, yeah. Yes, which we uh, debuted during Art Basel Miami. Um, we then also went on to launch a PFP project by Glenn Kaino um, in December. And what's um, PFP for, for those that might be unfamiliar? Um, it is a, uh, as I understand it, it is a profile pick project. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially, it's a project that is uh, rooted around community. Um, it typically will have a high number of NFTs pooled within that project um, and a communal aspect to it. Um, there are certain attributes that you can uh, be able to own if you uh, own certain rare NFTs or you buy into leveling up an NFT. Um, Glenn Kaino's PFP project was very interesting because he was really trying to uh, challenge the conversation specifically around NFTs and really uh, think about the ways in which we can embrace NFT technology to redistribute redist wealth. Mm. Um, so the project partners for that PFP project were actually charities. Mm. Um, and he wanted to you know, really change the conversation and see how we could actually use NFT technology to benefit uh, charitable contributions. 
Um, and then after that, we launched Jean Wan's uh, Metaverse project, which is Celestial uh, Bodies. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of a Metaverse trilogy project that he's been working on for quite some time. Um, Jean Wan's a performance artist, so it kind of was natural for him to embrace this technology and go into the space, just because his work has always really challenged the confines of the white cube. Mm -hmm. um, but as you can see, I mean, we kind of hit the ground running, and it's because we have so many artists whose practices really speak to, um, you know, going beyond just analog work and technology. And were we able to get some of the, I think there's some uh, images Yes, yeah. I hope that I hope that they were uh, going on the screen. <laughs> are they <laughs> while I was talking? Yeah, sorry. Um, are, are there videos? No. We can no. Oh, we can do that. If possible, I'd love just to show everyone here um, Lucas Morris's NFTs, which are the XYZ NFTs. Um, there are these digitally created works, um, which he renders in Photoshop. Lucas is it, very interesting about him. He's 85 years old. Um, and he just sits on his computer all day and just creates artworks. Um, he lives a block away from Carnegie Hall in the middle of Midtown. Um, so he'll leave his uh, apartment slash studio and just photograph uh, the city and then go back to his computer and quite literally just create work all day. Um, so that was the first NFT project. I don't know if we'll be able to get it up on well, the screen. Well, we can't see it. All right. Uh, okay. All right. Well, All right. We're just going to have to close your eyes and imagine it for a moment. <laughs> or, <and then> <laughs> or visit Pays Verso on yes. PaysGallery.com. Do that. Visit yes. Pays Verso. <laughs> Definitely. But for now, you'll just have to imagine it. Yes. Um, <laughs> apologies. Okay. So, one of the reasons we're talking about NFTs right now is because of things like the moment with people. You know, they are a source of incredible wealth for some artists. They're a source of incredible interest from collectors. There's a lot of money moving around in the world of NFTs. And you know, wealthy people have always purchased art as investments. That's nothing new. Um, but because NFTs have gained so much momentum as speculative assets in addition to being works of art, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on you know, whether they are financializing art and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I think from my former title, head of art and finance, I'm not opposed to the financialization of art. We might have some different um, perspectives on the stage about that. Uh, you know, I, I think what's interesting about the development of NFTs from a financial perspective are twofold. One, um, we've moved away, it used to just be, crypt not just, it used to be the domain of crypto boys, and I'm using that, or and women, but just the, the sort of crypto bro culture. It has now, um, it, it's taken seriously. I mean, the fact that Pace, I mean, you're so modest, Pace is you know, one of the most prestigious uh, galleries in the entire world, and also a, an, an arbiter of what is, uh, championed in the market and what's not. So we, you know, w w we see that. Um, and then, secondly, it makes fractional ownership um, more accessible to uh, a, wi a wider audience. I mean, look, I bought to people like me because I'm not buying a Picasso, but I could buy. Okay, it wasn't a Picasso. It was a Kenny Shackner, who's a, uh, a an artist and. Uh, and um, sort of commentator, critic of the art world. I bought a $300 uh, you know, NFT. I think it's really cool. It's, uh, it kind of make, pokes fun at the art world, the financialization of it. It's an image of Christie's sale room in London. And you see all of the prices of the work of art in different currencies. And then the, uh, superimposed on the image is a picture of a London street lamp that says, and you see these signs around London, careful, thieves operate in this area, <laughs> you know, which I thought was kind of, <laughs> kind of funny. Yes, uh, the art world is always, a, a, at a certain level, depending on how much money you're putting into a piece, it's higher risk than some other investments. I mean, we had the chairman of Sotheby's and his wife purchase a an $8.4 million Rothko that turned out to be a fake. And these are people with access to the best specialists in the world. Now, they, it was not because of, you know, 
they were taken in a broader fraud that many collectors were exploited in. But um, so you have to do your research, uh, get expert advice, and always buy what you like, not necessarily what you think. Oh, that's going to increase in value. Speaking to what you just said, I'm also thinking specifically from the artist standpoint um, and the fact that NFTs have been able to provide an opportunity for artists to be able to actually participate within their secondary market. So yes, thinking royalties. about analog artworks or traditional artworks, um, it's always kind of been this faux pas for artists to be involved within their secondary market, um, which is so weird to think about because this is this person's intellectual property at the end of the day. Um, with NFTs, you're able to, through a smart contract, uh, which is a set contract that's attached to the NFT token, mm -hmm. um, there are a set of royalty structures that an artist can embed um, and attach to an NFT, certifying the fact that whenever that NFT changes hands, it's transacted with and resold, they will get a portion of that transaction. Um, and that's something that's not very, very common specifically within the traditional art world. Mm -hmm. um, when it is done, it's kind of seen as, you know, this uh, weird thing that an artist is getting involved within that. So um, it's also really restructuring the way in which artists specifically are transacting and looking at their market as well. Gotcha. So instead of just making money the first time their art is sold, these In smart perpetuity. contracts yeah. enable them to make money every time they're resold. Exactly. And it's simple. I mean, not making the art. The art takes talent. But the actual <laughs> minting, yeah. the actual minting of it, you know, I, I, I tried it. I wanted to see how. And you go to a platform that's set up and you can click a button that you want real, royalties, you know. So um, for those of us who don't code, that's a good thing. What has it been like from an artist's perspective um, to see the impact of, of NFTs? And well, in, in my standpoint about NFTs, and I've, and I knew this since I, I launched the Mars House. Um, NFTs are the building blocks for the metaverse. So when I entered the NFT game, I realized that a lot of the early, uh, you know, platforms like Super Rare, n unknown, uh, unknown origin. Rarible, OpenSea, everyone was minting JPEGs and MP4 videos. Um, but what I also know is that the collectors were actually building um, galleries and homes in Decentraland, in metaverse platforms like Sandbox, CryptoVoxels, and displaying their art in these digital homes. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. So. These are assets that you can actually bring into the metaverse, and therefore, they are going to be the building blocks of the metaverse. Um, because we're very early, NFTs are going to become 3D digital assets that are powered by AI. Okay, that's the future. And when you really think about the acceleration of technology, especially um, in the sense of wearables, once the Apple glasses come out and they're adapted at scale, the world will change. We will no longer use cell phones. We will be wearing glasses, very lightweight and fancy, hopefully, uh, <laughs> which will allow us to experience the digital layer of hyper-reality. And this is what we are entering into. So, you know, just sort of knowing that this is coming, I, I kind of figured that it would be a good idea to start introducing the idea of real estate assets in the metaverse. However, what what has transpired since the Mars house was sold is a little bit crazy. It's a bit of a, a land grab metaverse thing, and I, I don't agree with this. I don't agree in market bubbles. Um, I don't think that it's um, a good thing to have a platform and you're selling land, digital land with a, you know, um, false uh, you know, rarity, right? I mean, the, the metaverse is ubiquitous, okay? So what is going to create value in the metaverse is the experience economy, which is culture and art activated with education, health and wellness, but art at the core because the metaverse is the greatest art project of human history. This is a project that is going to bring forth one of the greatest creative renaissances of, of human history as an intersection of art, technology, sciences. We need all hands on deck 
because it's not one person that's going to build the metaverse, certainly not going to be Zuckerberg and Meta single-handedly. It's going to be people who have a passion to create something, they're co-creating, creating community in the metaverse. Added value. I, I definitely still struggle a little bit with like the concept of buying a house in the metaverse because frankly I can barely buy a house in like the normal verse. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 trust, I trust your optimism where I want to trust your optimism. Um, so Laura, I don't know if you caught this, but she has a history of investigating art crimes, which means I really want to read her memoir someday. <laughs> um, and, you know, if you're unfamiliar with NFTs, one of the reasons you might have heard about them is because they keep getting stolen. Uh, people keep, keep getting, particularly there's a, a PYP, a, uh, a profile picture project called the Board Ape Yacht Club. I'm honestly sorry for telling you about this, but you need to know. Um, and there are these silly looking apes that sell for uh, I mind boggling sum and they keep getting stolen. Uh, the actor Seth Green recently had his ape seized by a hacker and has been trying to get it back. And um, that was a big deal for him because some of these PYP projects, including Board Ape Yacht Club, they interest people not because they're like so obsessed with this, the, the art itself, but because they allow them to license the, the image for commercial use. So Seth Green was planning on making a television show uh, with the ape as a character. And then when someone stole his ape, they stole the licensing rights. So now he can't make the show until he gets his ape back. I don't know if he's going to get his ape back. I love that sentence. He can't make the show until he gets his ape back. <laughs> so anyways, I'm giving you this background because, you know, one of the reasons people are so excited about NFTs is because they're on the blockchain and they provide this, uh, this ability for artists to authenticate their work and uh, to prove that, that this is the real thing, but then at the same time, they're all getting stolen. So I wanted to ask you, how should we be thinking about uh, NFTs in, in the context of like, are, th are they all gonna get stolen? Uh, are they well, especially vulnerable to hackers? Well, there is, I mean, there's crime in every market, mm -hmm. every market, I, and I would say the vast, and yes, some have been stolen. And yes, there's already been a big insider trading um, indictment issued for a uh, former executive at Open Seas, which is one of the big uh, NFT trading platforms. Uh, but, if, but the vast majority of NFTs have not been stolen. I mean, look, every technology at some point in human history has been, uh, has developed, uh, has, there are flaws, there are, I mean, just think about the internet. You're, we're constantly getting patches. Uh, I, you know, that, the big question is, is someone going to break the blockchain? In these cases, it, my, under, my understanding, and you probably know better, is that it was not the actual blockchain that was the vulnerability, but the platform giving access to, um, to the objects. Yeah, I've so. heard that Discord in particular, because that's yeah. a chatting app that a lot of NFT creators and people in the crypto space use, but it's, it wasn't intended to be that, so it's not really set up. Is that, was that one of the reasons why um, you created Pace Verso? Like, was security a consideration? Um, security was definitely a consideration um, in terms of the development for the platform. Um, it was something that we paid a lot of attention to, and it heavily influenced whom we partnered with. Uh, we actually partner with Palm Studios, which mm -hmm. is um, a side chain from mainnet Ethereum. Um, it bridges over to mainnet Ethereum, but it's not on the mainnet Ethereum network. Um, they have a fantastic storied history in terms of producing amazing mm -hmm. NFT projects, but also have a very solid uh, security infrastructure. Um, you know, we really tried to advocate for our clients in terms of really guiding them and directing them through the acquisition process. Um, we don't produce large-scale pro uh, projects at all. I mean, typically a lot of the ways in which people get their NFTs stolen is through some form of a phishing scam, which is very, very commonplace within Web 2 um, and also within Web 3 as well. 
Um, we're in the earliest iteration of the space. It's very much so like wild, wild west. Um, so with that, you have to be very careful because there aren't really many regulations in place in terms of protecting people. Yeah. Well, and that's always a tension in the art world because philosophically, in a democracy, we don't want to regulate art. Sure. You know, um, but when it becomes financialization, financialized, then yeah. we need to find appropriate. Seth's got to get his apes back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we only have five minutes left, oh, so I wanted to question. throw out a final question, um, which is, where do you see this space going in the future? You know, five years from now, ten years from now. What What is your assessment of, of this marketplace going forward? Um, I 100% agree with Krista in regards to this moving into the metaverse. I think specifically in terms of Pace Verso, um, we call it a Web3 platform. We actually don't call it an NFT platform because we very much so our understanding of the fact that NFTs are just the bridge in step specifically to the metaverse. We're thinking about Pace Gallery um, existing specifically within a virtual realm one day and bridging that into a virtual or in-person experience. Um, so, I mean, within the next five years, most definitely we're going to see um, interests more so pivot towards metaverse, also experiential elements within the metaverse, gamification as well, uh, mm -hmm. which is really big. And um, that's actually what really helped uh, PFP projects take off as well, but we understand that PFP projects are not sustainable projects, uh, but elements of it can be moved into the metaverse. Um, so that's, that's where I see things going. Yeah, exactly, yeah, I yeah. totally agree with you, um, Christiana. I mean, you know, art, uh, especially with the, as I said, the acceleration of, you know, um, hardware to enable us to experience the metaverse as a digital layer of reality, which will, be, which will be hyper real, meaning that it will almost be indistinguishable from what is real and what is digital. An, a layer, so fashion, art, architecture, um, every experience that we have will be enhanced with some kind of an experiential enhancement that is considered art. And NFTs um, are going to allow us to own these assets, sell these assets, create a robust marketplace of these assets, not limited just art, but uh, you know, fashion and all kinds of experiences. Will you wear your glasses? We're in this room. All of us are wearing interactive 3D fashion, and we're, it's, it's all in motion, it's all programmed with AI. I mean, even the, the, the space itself can be enhanced or altered. We could be sitting in a forest. So, um, you know, the idea of what art will become uh, is going to be just open, right? So the definition of art itself will be transformed. And my focus, I'm actually creating a metaverse studio called Zero Point XYZ. And our focus is to really create a foundation of the metaverse for future generations that is focused on culture and humanity at the intersection of science and education. Because I think that we need to pull away from games and fun into more serious, adult, important cultural legacy, which we are going to bring forth into the metaverse into infinity, really, because that's what it means. Our culture becomes a permanent record in the blockchain for an alien race to learn about us one day. So, so I agree yeah. that we're you know, in an art historic concept uh, the metaverse, NFTs are going into the metaverse. We are progressing, you know, the dematerialization of art uh, has you know, been in a constant march where you know, if you think back to you know, a time when these beautiful oil paintings, these, th that, that was art. And today you have uh, you know, a, a ready-made, you have a vacuum cleaner that is in a piece of plexiglass that is in a scholarly museum, and that is a piece of art. Uh, you know, we could go into three-hour lectures of why, <laughs> but, uh, but there, so there, there is a transition here. And in terms of uh, at where's the pivot point where it goes into museums? I mean, there's always that conversation between the market and the, the scholarship. 
Uh, right now, we have NFTs and uh, in you know, LACMA, in uh, contemporary museums. We don't yet have them in the Universalist, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And the, uh, the CEO of the Met was interviewed a couple months ago and asked about NFTs. And Dan said that it was, um, you know, not his job to, he said it much more eloquently, but basically we're not jumping on that ship yet. He said it much, much better the way a PhD in art history would. Uh, but uh, he acknowledged that, it, that, you know, this is happening. So I don't know, I'd be interested in your thoughts of when it's going to, if I may ask a question, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not no, the go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> um, of at what point will it make that jump? Um, I think specifically a lot of institutions are already starting to look to making that mm -hmm. jump. I think that they really understand the fact that um, museums are supposed to represent community in mm -hmm. a sense, right? Um, there are a lot of artists already within their helm that are investigating the Web3 space and specifically contributing to the, the Web3 space through NFT projects. Um, you mentioned LACMA, ICA Miami has also acquired an NFT as well. The Walker, maybe? The Walker, yes. Albright Knox is looking to it as well. Really what the bridge is right now in terms of being able to move within that space is museums are, are public entities. Um, and with everything that they do, especially in terms of you know, creating a wallet, um, creating this uh, collection that you know, is going to amass some form of wealth, um, they have to make sure that they're following the right legal parameters. Um, so really the bridge that's sort of uh, keeping institutions from moving forward very, very quickly in terms of creating NFT collections apart from like trying to avoid the speculation right, within yeah. the market um, is the fact that they legally want to do it right. Um, so, That's you know, yeah, once they're able to get over that hump, I think that we'll see a lot of uh, institutions enter the space. Yeah. I feel like if we have this conversation a year from now, so much will have changed that I could ask you the yeah. same questions again. We might have it, might have it in the metaverse. Yeah, yeah. different yeah. answers. Precisely. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Yeah. Um, oh, gosh. This is very <laughs> stressful. Okay. I think the woman with the blue dress and the glasses raised her hand first. Thank you. That was incredibly interesting. I, one of the reasons I wanted to attend was for this because I keep hearing about it. Um, so that was illuminating. But I have one question, which is after you acquire it, what exactly are you, I mean, you described an image, but when I get a piece of art, I can put it somewhere. Every time somebody walks into that space or I walk into that space, it exists, it's there. What exactly are you getting and how does that you transfer you, to others. You receive uh, the NFT as a file in your wallet. And uh, if you're making a transaction to purchase an NFT, most likely you're using a MetaMask wallet, which is uh, you know, the, the most, one of the most popular wallets, a Coinbase, for example. Uh, once it's transferred to your wallet, make sure that you transfer it into a ledger or you know, a hard, hard. A hard wallet, okay? Your own wallet with your own code, so no one can access that. That will prevent that from being hacked. Um, but if you want to display your art, which I'm very interested in, my art has always been about displaying large LED screens. I wanna, you know, transform the screen into a mechanism for healing and wellness and meditativeness as an experience. Um, so screens are possible, and you can buy beautiful screens. Samsung has a frame. Uh, you know, brand, a line that specializes in fine art display. Uh, you know, there are so many different options now. But I think having a, um, an LED wall or an LED screen in your home dedicated to art, I mean, this is, this is the future. Speaking about um, the advancement of technologies in terms of wearables or even technologies that um, really are able to work well within the Web3 space, talking about these LED screens, there are LED screens that actually can pair with your wallet. Um, so you can quite literally switch through all of the NFT assets that Samsung? you have within your wallet. Is it Samsung? Samsung? Yep. There's Samsung. also a couple of other companies that aren't so well known, mm -hmm. um, but within the NFT space are sort of looked at as the arbiters in terms of providing the best uh, uh, resolution because that's very, very big to NFT collectors as well, yeah. making sure that their art is well presented. I should also say specifically for Pace Verso, 
um, something that we have done uh, with our artists and also with collectors, thinking about traditional art collectors that are really interested in terms of engaging with this, within the space. Um, some of our artists have actually done physical assets with their NFT um, to sort of accompany that NFT. Now it's not a purist NFT, um, but it is a nice bridge in terms of collectors that really do want to be able to have that physical asset. Um, but also, you know, be able to engage with it, the technology and have the token as well. And the beautiful thing is when you collect an NFT, you can DM the artist and ask them for a physical copy. You can actually ask. And most artists are very happy to oblige. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting. I was want, had a question about... Uh, possibly what, um, trans transferring a physical item or a physical painting into an NFT. Is there a way that a collector and an artist could collaborate and say, take a, a, an original painting and make that an NFT as well? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there actually are um, companies that are doing this already. Uh, there's a company called Fairchain specifically um, that provides uh, this uh, an ERC token, an NFC token, um, which specifically would be the provenance that's attached to a physical asset. Um, so, and there's more companies to come that are already doing that. Um, there are some galleries that have already on their own ventured into uh, tying NFT tokens specifically to physical assets um, just to prove authenticity uh, and to further uh, provide authenticated provenance. Um, so it's, it most definitely is possible. Yeah. It, it's used in, for luxury watches. Um, yes. You have a lot of NFTs now authenticating luxury goods. Chanel so, bags. Chanel bags, <laughs> Lamborghini now. You know, I, I did a collaboration with Lamborghini. The physical Lamborghini comes with the NFT. It was a collaboration with Steve Aoki. And that went on, on uh, sale at Sotheby's. Oh, Hi, thank you. Very um, enlightening. Um, I work in the film world, and um, I run a film festival, and we were submitted a film that confused me. Um, it was by a muralist in Paris, and uh, he had taken this huge mural, which was probably about six times this room in a space in Paris, and cut it up into NFTs to sell on the internet. And then there was also the documentary involved. And I wanted to ask what all this meant. Uh, if you own a little section of this mural, do you get to see the mural? How, how does a little piece that he sold add up? And what does it mean in terms of this documentary, which also has got images of the entire um, mural as well? I think it's exciting. It's like, I mean, I would love to own a little bit of the Berlin Wall. Yeah. Kind of that sort of same concept, at least in my mind. But it, it really depends on how the artist wants to structure the presentation of this project. Uh, he could digitize the mural and then section it. And then each owner will have their own piece that they see physically. And there is a project by Snark Art. I, the name escapes me. Snark Art, S N A R K dot art. Mm. They actually released a very historically significant NFT project. It's a it's um, it's a Renaissance painting that has been fractionalized, but also turned into a short film, right? So it's a Renaissance painting that's animated like a short film, and so I think it's fractionalized into like over a thousand pieces, and each owner has the option of um, allowing their piece to be screened for public screenings. So this is a yes or a no. So there are screenings of this project publicly. There are spaces that are gray for those people who just forgot to say yes or didn't want their piece to be shown. So it's a very interesting project. So you, I guess the question is, do you ever get to see the whole thing? Well, that's the thing. It, uh, it, it depends on how the project is designed if you give the choice to the community, you're going to end up with some people who just don't allow it or forget. But if it's something where you, you actually allow people to buy fractionalized pieces of a mural, but it's always shown, it's always, you know, 
you know, fully, you know, in full constitution. I mean, that's, that's an artistic choice. That's all it is. So you'll have to ask, really, because it, it will depend on what the artist decided, how they decided to structure the contract. They might be like, nope, can't watch it, and then you probably shouldn't show it. The film. But I, ideally, it would but. be nice to have a fractionalized image of your section. That, For me, that would mean there's more value to the collector. That's what I would include. There's a man yeah. in the blue shirt. Oh. Hi, thank you. So um, let's say a, an artist uh, creates a song, writes all the lyrics, mm -hmm. lays down all of the tracks, writes the music, has it produced and recorded. Then what does she do to create an NFT from it? Are there, are there platforms? Does yes. she go to it alone? And then she controls all the licensing from it. What's the next step? There are, there are music uh, NFTs out there. Uh, the the well-known uh, DJ Blau came out with a project. Ah, the name escapes me right now. But it is basically a, um, you know, uh, a place where you know, recording artists can actually create their own um, records. And they can, they can find many ways of selling this right. You could do it as a one of one song, right? That is exclusively owned by one person. But I mean, I think if you're starting out, you may want to run a series, right, of this song. Maybe you're offering, you know, a thousand versions of the song and you're selling each for, what, $20 or, you know, whatever, what have you. This, the price of an album, right? So, but what it does is it allows the community to really invest in, you know, in, in the artist and create this very close-knit relationship. So really what NFTs do, it creates the community and that relationship with the artist that's more intimate and direct. And if you have like all of these collectors' wallets, then you can airdrop them gifts. You can, you can do all kinds of interesting activations in real life, in the metaverse. I mean, it's, it's an interesting tool. It's still very early, but music is starting to sell in, in the metaverse. Snoop Dogg launched an open sea like album or songs, like unreleased mm -hmm. songs, he sold them all. And he's made more money selling NFTs in two years than an entire career in the traditional uh, music scene. And to also answer your question specifically in terms of whether they want to do it on their own or if they want to do it with a platform, um, there are advantages to either. I would say specifically artists that are very new within the space, they typically will go to a platform directly. Um, it provides you know, an ecosystem where they can tap into a specific network and community that they don't have access to naturally. Um, typically, the artists that venture into the space and do projects on their own via um, uh, their own microsite projects, which have their own uh, unique points of sale, already have a sustained community. Um, they have a lot of engagement and some experience within the, the Web3 space. Um, so those are typically the defining factors in terms of how artists navigate the space. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a lot of fun, and uh, I can't wait to speak about it more maybe next year. We'll see. Thanks. Thanks.